Hello and welcome back. So what I want to do today is make a proper model for the TL431. Now you might remember from last time that the models that are available from the major manufacturers are not that good. I mean, they're good, you can use them, but they're not accurate enough for my personal taste. So if you're curious about how you can make a better model for the TL431, one that better resembles the measurements that we've done last time, then keep watching. So I won't be starting off from scratch. The model I'll be using is based on the one from OnSemi. So let's quickly have a look at it, see how it's built and how they've designed it. So this is the model that you can find on their website. So this is the model laid out as a comment in LTSpice. And what I've done to make it a bit more visually easy to follow is lay out all the components according to their netlist. Now you can check to see if this has been done well by looking under the view, spice netlist window, and here you will see all of the components that are in your schematic. And you can check component for component and net for net how these components are connected compared to the original model. So I hope I didn't make any mistakes. But anyway, now if we run this thing and apply an input pulse going from 0 to 5, we can see that the voltage on the reference pin is completely unaffected and it switches at around 2.5 volts. So just like we've seen in the model, but this is not like we've seen in the measurement. So we need to do some fixing here. So first of all, let's look at how this model was built. They're using as a reference a behavioral voltage source whose voltage is 2.5 volts if the cathode anode voltage is above 2.5 volts, otherwise it's the cathode anode voltage. So net 7 and 6 are the cathode and the anode of the model. Now they're comparing this to the reference pin and driving a current source. Then we have a bunch of resistors and capacitors. This basically models the frequency response behavior. Then we have another voltage dependent current source, which drives the output. And then we have a couple of diodes and the voltage source. And the role for these is first of all, D1 is preventing any sort of voltage going out of the circuit. So you can only sync current. And then the combination of D2 and voltage source one set the minimum voltage to which the circuit can clamp. So basically this is where this lower voltage threshold so the output doesn't drop to zero, it drops to about 1.6 volts. So this is where this 1.6 volts is coming from. Two volts minus the voltage drop on D2 and then adding the voltage drop on D1. So what do we need to do to improve this model? What are the things that we need to fix on it? Well, let's take it one at a time. So the first thing that we've noticed in our measurements was that the input voltage doesn't continue when there's a voltage applied to it larger than 2.5 volts, but rather it's limited. Now, one way of doing this is to simply take a diode and connect it from the input to the cathode of the circuit. And if we do this, we get quite a weird behavior. So first of all, we get this glitch thing, and then we see that the voltage sort of stabilizes on the input pin. Now, another thing we can say since we're talking about the input pin is that there's absolutely no current going through it before 2.5 volts. So it's in the order of nanoamps. Whereas if we look in the data sheet, we can see that the input current is around two microamps. Now this again is important to model in case you're creating a circuit with very large feedback resistors, then this current will start to become a problem. So what we can do to model both the effect of this diode and the current consumption on the input pin is simply put a transistor on the input. So just like we see in the schematic of the circuit, we can model this first transistor and simply add some sort of resistor in its emitter, something like this. So I added the generic transistor and the five kilo ohm resistor. And now if we simulate and look into the 
reference pin of the circuit. Well, we still have this glitch, so we're gonna have to fix that a bit later. But now, if we look at the current going through this pin, just before we reach the 2.5 volt threshold, we are getting somewhere around 1.1 microamps. I mean, it's not exactly 1.8, but it's much better than 10 nanoamps. Now, one of the weird things that they've done with this model is to set the reference voltage dynamic. So if the cathode anode voltage drops below 2.5, then set it to that voltage. This being in the idea that if you're not supplying the circuit with enough voltage, then how can you have your reference voltage higher than that voltage? So I went ahead and tried this out, see how this behaves in real life. So what I got here is the same setup we've had last time. The only difference being that I'm no longer applying a sawtooth wave, so one that goes from 0 to 5 down to 0 directly and then slowly rises, but rather a proper triangle wave, one that slowly rises to 5 and then slowly drops to 0 again. And what we can observe from this is that the voltage at which the signal switches, so with yellow we see the voltage on the reference pin, and with blue we see the voltage on the cathode, and we can see that the switching action, so when the switch goes from off to on and again to off, is roughly at the same voltage. So we're passing through the yellow line at almost exactly the same voltage both on a rising and on a falling edge. Or in other words, at 2.5 volts. So here both the blue and the yellow traces are at the same voltage, blue being the voltage in the cathode, and we can see clearly that even though the cathode voltage is much lower than the reference voltage, the switch switches at a higher voltage than we have in the cathode. Or in other words, this sort of behavior is not correct. We need to have a fixed voltage reference. Something like this. Now if we run this, and we now check the input reference pin, what do you know? We fixed one of our problems. We no longer have this glitch going on. So what else is there to fix? Well, if we go back to the datasheet and look at the block diagram and also at the schematic, one of the components that we see in the schematic, but not in the model, is this diode going from anode to cathode. So this is a protection diode built into the silicon chip that will conduct in case we are reverse supplying this circuit. And it's one of those components that of course we don't have in the model, so we can simply add it. We add this generic diode and there we go. Good. Now, let's extend the time period a bit more to see if there's any other problems in the model. So if I now simulate for two seconds rather than one second and look in the cathode, open up our previous measurement picture, we see one thing that we shouldn't be seeing. And that is this spike here. So when the switch turns off, we don't just get the 12 volts that we're supplying the circuit with, we get a spike going up to 16 volts, which does not appear in the real measurement. So where's this coming from? Well, if we look for the circuit, we have this voltage dependent current source. And right at the time when we get the spike, the output of the source jumps from 0 point something to a very high voltage. So 36 in this case. Basically, D1 is reverse polarized, so you're no longer getting any sort of current going through the circuit. But D1 is not a perfectly ideal diode, it has a bit of capacitance. And when we have this jump in voltage, we have a certain current going reversely through the diode. And this is causing the voltage in the cathode to increase above the 12 volts that we're supplying the circuit with. So what we need to do is simply make G2 only provide negative current, not positive current. And we can do this with a behavioral current source that will replace this voltage dependent current source. And to make things a bit more easy to see, we can simply drag this equation out of the way. So what I did here was take the voltage in node 3 in reference to node 6, and if it's 
a negative voltage, then we have the current source drawing current, otherwise there's zero current going through this source. And if we run this thing, check the current, now we only have negative current, it's no longer going positive, and if we check the voltage in the cathode, we no longer have any spikes. Now another interesting feature that we can see, thanks to the addition of the transistor, is that the voltage in the cathode drops even though the switch is off. And this is one of those behaviors that we do see in the real life measurement. So you can clearly see this cathode voltage dropping in the real thing. So what's going on? Isn't the switch supposed to be off? Well, it is off, but you still need to supply the circuit. And this is one of those things that we find in the datasheet under the minimum cathode current needed for regulation. So to get the circuit to work, to get the reference at the correct voltage, we need to supply it with a bit of current, even if we're not turning on the final switch transistor. And in the simulation, we're achieving this by the Q1 and R6 pair. Basically, if you're polarizing Q1 with any sort of voltage, it will start to turn on and conduct into R6. So basically what's happening here with this voltage drop in the cathode is that we're getting a bit of current, so 0.4 milliamps in this case, driving R6. It's not the one milliamp that the datasheet is talking about, but it's very close. And basically, this is what a much better model for this circuit looks like. So I'll be leaving this model in the description. Check it out, try it out, let me know if you have any problems with it. And basically, next time we can finally start to simulate some circuits with the TL431. So hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.